Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. My name is uh, Deputy Commissioner Kevin McBride from the OC DEP, and hopefully you're all here for the LAPC, the local emergency planning committee meeting, our annual meeting. And just for the record, it's uh, the reason we have this meeting. It's uh, by federal law, 1986 Federal Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act, SARA, Title III, and also known as the Emergency Planning and Community Rights No Act. That's right. Is an act to provide local communities with information concerning chemical hazards present in their respective communities and to facilitate the development of chemical emergency response plans by state and local governments. So if you're not here for that, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I think the first thing we'll do is go around the room for introductions. And just uh, normally our director of uh, emergency response and hazards um, team is not here today. It's Harry Meyer. Wasn't able to make it, so um, Deputy Director General Nurse will carry uh, his part of the meeting. But I guess we'll just go around the room and let everybody introduce themselves. Andy? Oh, sure. Uh, Andy DeMurray, Emergency Management. I'd just like to say, on behalf of the Commissioner, thanks for DEP and Chief McBride for hosting this every year. And uh, it's an important function that the uh, city must go through. So thanks everyone for being here. And just for the confusion, he called me Chief McBride. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> For the record, I'm the chief with the NYPD assigned over to DEP as a deputy commissioner, so it's two roles. But... No, sorry, I gave you seat. No. My, name is sorry. My name is Joanne Nurse, I'm deputy director for emergency response and technical assessment at DEP. Hi, my name is Afroza Amin, I'm a hazmat supervisor, emergency response and technical assessment. Denise Clark, right to you, DEP. Rick Flynn, New York State DEC. Peter Fosco, I'm Chief of the New York City uh, DEP Police. Connor Lynch, the Emergency Management Operations Center. Uh, Milena Ferlone, New York City DOH, Emergency Planning and Operations. Kara Neaton, she, her, hers. I'm um, Agency Counsel at uh, OEM, Eric Nice. Uh, Bills and Foster, OEM, Facility Manager. Shoshana Cooper, New York City Transit Operations Planning. Nobody in the Black New York City Emergency Management and Intergovernmental Affairs. Yeah, good morning, folks. I'm Captain Vincent Serino. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been the Executive Officer for FDNY Hazmat Operations. Robert Wilson, Deputy Director of Legal Affairs, New York City Emergency Management. I'm Columbia Vanderbilt with Logistics here at New York City Emergency Management. And just, uh, Elena introduced herself as uh, the Public Health Mental Hygiene. Uh, many of you, if you've been to the meetings before, uh, Elena used to sit with us on this side. She was one of our presenters for the last several years from uh, from DEP at uh, the DERDA, and now uh, she transferred over to health. So, thank you. Guess so. Uh, with Rob, you're going to read the minutes from last year's meeting. Uh, last year's local emergency planning meeting was held on June 15, 2018. The meeting opened up by going over the 2017 update on the Tier 2 submissions, which was presented by DEP. The next part of the agenda was discussing the Hazardous Substance Advisory Board. The Hazardous and Substance Advisory Board meeting was made part of that meeting um, as it is a subset of the LEPC. Then moved on to Effective Chemical Risk Management Program update that was also directed and led by DEP. They gave an update on emergency responses for the preceding year. An update was also provided on Local Law 143, which was enacted after Hurricane Sandy, concerned with chemicals, uh, when the city was concerned with chemical storage facilities near waterways. Um, DEP also discussed the Memorandum of Understanding between Con Edison, National Grid, and DEP. For more detailed information about last year's LEPC minutes, you could find that on New York City Emergency Management's website. Thank you, Rob. Any questions on last year's minutes? No? Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Director Nurse to give an update on uh, Tier 2 submissions for the year. Okay, good morning again, everyone. We'll just give you a little um, summary on what we've been doing so far for the 2018 submission year. We began our Tier 2 year with a series of workshops and webinars during the month of January through March. These workshops and webinars focus on educating the facility owners of the local Law 143 and the newly added physical and health hazards to the safety data sheet. 
We continue to work with consultant firms to migrate the clients from filing hard copy to online filing. We have acquired a list of registered auto repair and auto body shops, businesses from the Department of Motor Vehicles website, and we are currently performing inspections at these facilities to ensure compliance with the community right to know law. We have also developed a risk management plan database with step-by-step -step guidelines for reviewing and submitted plans for completeness. Once these plans are approved with all required documentation, inspections are scheduled to, proper, to ensure proper compliance with the law. We'll give you an update on the tier two submission as we go into the Hazard Service Advisory Board meeting. Okay, I think we're ready to go into that. And just, uh, we're required to have this meeting annually. We also have to have quarterly hazardous advisory uh, substance board meetings. And uh, we combine the one quarter at this meeting, so this is a dual purpose. So Joanne's gonna read the, the minutes from the H uh, last meeting and go over the metrics. The last meeting was held on March 13th, 2019 at 10.30 at our DEP headquarters in Lafayette City. The, we went over the year in progress. We reported that we held six workshops during the month of January and February to assist the facilities with their filings. We explained that four of our workshops were held at DEP headquarters and two were held in the outer boroughs, one in Staten Island and the other in the Bronx. We expressed that we are trying to find a location in Brooklyn in order to hold a workshop for the next filing year. We are continuing to hold host annual webinars to assist the new um, required um, facilities with their filing throughout the year. Okay, we've, um, the webinars are focusing on the new local law requirements as well as to promote awareness of new tier two farm, which included the newly added physical and health hazard section. The webinars were well attended and the feedback was very positive. The Right to Know program plans to hold additional workshops throughout the year. The submissions, we work with New York City business experts to convert their customers from submitting hard copy submissions to online submissions. As a result, we, have, we were able to convert 91 facilities to online filing. The metrics as of 2019 metrics, we received 10,074 tier two submissions. 267 were received from new facilities. Um, Ms. Yaku gave the metrics. She reported that 9,637 facilities completed their submission online, and 437 facilities submitted a hard copy submission. Ms. Yaku had also explained that the Right to Know program has 350 risk management plans on file an additional 39 were required to submit RMPs. We received 92 risk management plans affidavit letters and 53 updated RMPs. We performed 6,627 inspections and there were 60 facilities that were exempt from filing. 289 facilities went out of business and 207 were issued notices of violations. Dr. Harry Meyer explained that the penalties for Local Law 143, which was promulgated on November 6, 2018, have now been established. Mr. Meyer also stated that the program will not issue violations right away for non-compliance of the law, but instead will continue to educate the facilities on the law as inspections are completed throughout the year. Dr. Meyer also explained that the facilities will be given 30 days to comply with the law after which non-compliance facilities will be issued a commissioner order and or violation. Dr. Elena Filoni stated that the emergency response team is preparing for the next inspector day, which will be held at the EPA location in New Jersey. Ms. Dr. Filoni explained that the focus of the meeting will be into agency collaboration and during the upcoming meeting, each agency will provide a brief summary regarding what they do in order to effectively collaborate with other agencies. Dr. Meyer then announced that Dr. Filoni will be leaving her position at DEP on March 22nd and has accepted a position with the Department of Health. Dr. Harry thanked Dr. Elena for all her hard work and dedication throughout the year. Dr. Meyer recapped the numbers of emergency responses for the year and stated that the numbers were again within 5% of each other as compared to last year's numbers. Dr. Meyer also stated that there were no major increases in the numbers of any one category of the types of responses that Derby handles. He also ranked them 
the types of responses from the number of highest responses to the lowest. Mr. Myers spoke about the upcoming deployment dates. Uh, he stated that the upcoming weekend included St. Patrick's Parade on Saturday and the United Airlines Half Marathon on Sunday. Dr. Myers stated that the dates for our upcoming deployments were which are the Yankee Home Opener on March 28, 2019, Mets Home Opener on April 4, 2019, 9-11 Memorial 5K Walk on April 28th, and the Five Hour Bike Tour on May 25, 2019. The media concluded when Dr. Mary asked everyone if they had any questions. Kevin Clark from OEM stated that he was still he was still working on data mapping and a meeting invitation for further discussion in relation to this topic will be forthcoming. Mr. Kevin Clark also stated that all of the agencies that were on the phone today in addition to NYPD will be involved. Dr. Mary thank everyone for participating and um, joining the call. Thank you, Joanne. Any questions on the HSAB notes? Good. Moving along. Okay. For the current year of Tier 2 submission metrics, we received 10,797 submissions, 423 facilities were added to the database, 374 new facilities submitted reports, then 10,230 facilities submitted online, and 567 facilities submitted hard copy reports. 95% of our facilities as of today have submitted online reports. Regarding the risk management plan, the program has a total of 356 RMPs on file as of June 3rd, 2019. An additional 41 facilities are required to submit RMPs. 88 facilities have reported updates on their plans and 105 affidavits have been received indicating that no changes have been made to their risk management plans. In regards to inspection, during the fiscal year 2019, the inspection unit has performed a total of 8,934 inspections. 459 facilities went out of business and 303 were in violation of the law. Thank you, Joanne. Yes. Just as a note with the, uh, the online filings, that's a massive improvement over the years that because uh, the, the DB Dirty Unit's been really pushing hard to have the online submissions because it makes it easier all around. It's because they, all these submissions, all 10,000 of them have to be reviewed before they're approved. And it's much easier with the online uh, submissions to review them as opposed to hard, hard copies. So in the years past, probably going back a few years ago, there would be 3,000, 3, 3 to 4,000 hard copies submitted that people would have to sit down and go through page by page. So besides making it easy for the, the business owner to file online. It's easier for us and it frees up our uh, staffing to do other things like inspections. So uh, kudos to my staff for really pushing. I'm going to do the, uh, the hazmat metrics. That's our responses. Uh, Defoza, are you doing that? Or? Yes. Okay. So um, for FY19 to date, Dirta responded to 3,184 responses. So that's an average of 265 responses per month. Two-third of our responses occurred during business hours, and the rest, the one-third, is during evening and weekend hours. 45% of our responded, responses are from chemical odors, followed by 15% um, from large oil spills. The next biggest category are chemical spills or releases, and that includes natural gas leaks, and that's 11% of our responses. Um, we have 6% of our responses from abandoned chemicals, 5% from small oil spills, 3% from unsafe chemical storage complaints, 2% is from carbon monoxide, um, and then 1% from WMD or explosive complaint or responses, and 1% from steam pipe, manhole explosions, or any other special investigations that we go to. Uh, we also do deployments, so, so far, year to date, the deployments are St. Patrick's Day Parade, we had the Yankees Home Opener, the Mets Home Opener, the United Airlines Half Marathon, the 9-11 Memorial 5K Walk, the 5 Foro Bike Tour, the Brooklyn Half Marathon, and the Salute to Israel Day Parade. And um, upcoming deployments, we have Puerto Rican Day Parade, this weekend, actually, 
and at the end of the month we have the Heritage Pride Parade, which this year um, they're combining that with the International Day. So that's on June 30th. Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, correct the number with that for the record. The 11% the with chemical spills and natural gas, it's actually 11%, 11%. Oh, so sorry. Just, no, it's just a matter of what it was said. So it's actually that those numbers make up 22%. So, so nobody's misled. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody, any questions on the responses? Um, just do an update on the local law 40, 143, I think we just, uh, the fines were going over. Yes, it's just, wow, well, we just have one small update regarding the penalty proportion of the local law 143. Um, as you heard from the minutes that was read by Mr. Wilson, um, the local law 43 is the law for proper siting and storage of hazardous substances. This rule has gone into effect of January 2019. DEP right to know inspectors has begun to incorporate compliance of this law during their regular inspections. We have created a brochure which was handed out to you here if you want to take a chance to look at it. This brochure will use the aid of facility owners during inspections as what is required of them to do. Um, the penalty codes were adopted by OAF. The ranges are from first with the first offense, $500, to the third offense, $7,500. So there are three codes that were enforced by both. We haven't have we given any yet? No, we gave them this our first year, so we'll give warnings and <coughs> recommendations of what they're supposed to do, and as of next year, we'll start to implement violations if necessary. And this originally started as a best practices and then got voted in approved as a, a law, and then the, the fines get added. So this will probably be the last update we have to give on it, yes. other than say my choice. Close the case on that. Uh, Frozy, you're going to go over the, uh, usually we like to close the meeting with just some um, jobs that we responded to and uh, notable uh, responses. I guess just one question. Uh, who's, who's in the enforcers? Is it going to be DPO enforcing, enforcing this? From our end, yeah. Our end. Okay. Yeah. okay, I just want to understand if there were fire units doing their regular building inspection and they came upon this, uh, how that would play out. Yeah, it just wasn't easy. Yeah. We, we, yeah. we enforce our, because remember when they were developing this law, yeah. there was a lot of back and forth between fire and DEC uh, because of who was going to be responsible for what. Okay. And, you know, we're responsible for our portion of it. Yeah. Okay. And I, you know, I, I don't know as far as fire department is uh, if there's something that you would in, in enforce when you're, yeah, when you're doing be, inspection. It should be a notification. Uh, yeah, it, so it that's, that, yeah. If we came upon Yeah, and that's, that's fine. That's, oh, okay. We would probably do the same thing yeah. if there was some fire related we notify you. Okay. Okay, so um, today we're going to discuss a mercury spill that we had in Brooklyn. Um, so. If you don't know, mercury is the only metal that remains in a liquid form at room temperature. And the droplets are shiny silver white with a high surface tension, so they, they appear rounded on flat surfaces. I'm sure most of us know what mercury looks like. Um, played around with it in science classes, but no. Yes, we used to play with it. <laughs> yeah. Now so, they evacuate buildings. Yes. <laughs> yes. So on January 31st, 2019, we received a complaint of a liter of mercury that was spilled. Um, so during our investigation, we determined that um, there was a spill and they attempted to clean it up. However, it wasn't done properly. And it resulted in a contamination of a two-story building and a storefront. And, um, you know, as you, like I mentioned, nowadays we have to clean it up so it must be cleaned up using a special mercury vacuum and any contaminated material that we have including the jar and the, that we collect the mercury in the mer uh, the carpet the flooring everything else must where the spill occurred must be removed and um, with temperature mercury changes into a gas and can dissipate around the area contaminating the area so as a result, DOH evacuated the um, building and DEP issued a commissioner order to the building manager 
for a proper remediation and the removal of mercury and contaminated surfaces. The owner did not obtain a proper license contracted to perform the cleanup, therefore defaulting on the commissioner's order and resulting in major contamination of the building and exuberant cost. The cleanup has to be done by a certified, certified licensed contractor. So, you know, they had to get another contractor and the cleanup is still ongoing. And once this licensed contractor finishes the cleanup process, DEP will perform a joint inspection with DOHMH before the building is deemed safe for occupancy. And DOHMH will determine whether it's, um, will determine whether the levels are along with DOHMH, whether the levels are appropriate and DOHMH will lift the um, evacuation order of the building. As a note of caution, um, just if you have any old mercury thermometers or any mercury type devices that you have laying around, don't throw them out in the garbage. Uh, Department of Sanitation, um, you can call them, 311 or their website. They have uh, information on their website under the Household Hazardous Waste Collection Program on how to properly dispose of it. So they have special instructions on how they want it packed, where you can bring it to, and um, they also have, I believe, companies, if something does spill, a small spill, companies that will send you a kit to properly clean it up and send it back to them. And then first, did you just... Uh I don't know if you indicated how exactly this spill happened to you, you know, um, and how so much of a spill it was. From what I remember, because this wasn't originally my job, I believe that um, a tenant was moving out, and he was a science teacher. Um, so he had a mercury, I guess a training kit. He dropped it, and he didn't let any of anybody know that he dropped it. So as he was leaving the building, he decided to call 311 and said, oh, there's a mercury spill. I accidentally dropped it. But since he was moving and he dropped in his apartment, now he tracked it all throughout the building um, and outside. As you can see, it's been almost six months and the building's still unoccupied, but this is serious business. All right, any other questions on the, the responses? Um, I think we're about to close, and uh, Joanne, we have another HSAB meeting scheduled? In um, September. We have, the next one will be in September. We haven't scheduled a date as yet. Okay. And anybody that's on the list here will be notified if you want to call in. Uh, you want to go around the room? Does anybody have any other issues or questions for the LEPC? No? Rob? Andy? Good, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you everybody for coming, and uh, we'll see you next year. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.